Good morning, everybody. <laughs> to the extent that uh, a number of you were up late watching some of the Super Tuesday returns, I appreciate you uh, coming out bright and early for what we're referring to as befuddled Wednesday. So we, <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. Um, so I think as a Gina joked, you know, running the Bipartisan Policy Center at this moment in American history is a somewhat you know, proud and lonely endeavor. <laughs> but what is exciting to be here today is that I think one of the areas where there is truly a fundamental you know, shared interest across the political spectrum is about innovation and American ingenuity. I think it really is the beachhead in what has been a pretty tribal discussion that allows us to move forward. So a lot of questions. Um, around that you know, basic optimism. But let me start out um, talking about the Supreme Court and the stay and the rest of it. I think you made the point, you've made it before, that this legal interruption uh, is not going to interrupt the fundamental transition in the, the power sector, based on the idea that the CPP was essentially kind of harnessing that momentum. And talk a little more about those market drivers. You know, what, what do you believe is happening that's just fundamental to the system? I think people know here that, and Jason and I actually have worked uh, a long time together, you know, people know that we've been trying to address the issue of, of climate change for a long time. And for the first time, I feel that the momentum is not just coming from, it's certainly not just coming from the states anymore, the national uh, government is engaged as it should, but it's also coming from the business sector, um, and it's coming from people themselves. The technologies have dramatically changed. They've gotten cost effective and efficient. And as long as you, know, you, you match those drivers together, which is what do we need to do to protect public health? How do we align our national policies and rules to, to drive in that direction? And you have you know, the economics work for new technologies. The rest just happens. And so as we were looking at designing the Clean Power Plan, you know, I have, I have said all the time that my job is to reduce pollution. When we do that, we look at the technologies available, what's cost effective, how do we base our rules on that. But the reason why we did it so flexibly is that the world is changing. You know, it's all heading in the direction that we need. And so why wouldn't we allow everybody to develop technologies that get better and better, more energy efficiency, more renewable energy, and allow states to take advantage of that? So to me, the, bus the business community is driving this. Consumers are driving this, as much as EPA is articulating this as a pollution strategy. That's the sweet spot for everything we do. So let's talk a little bit about flexibility, I think, as any of you who've been watching Washington know, that's always the demand. You know, how do we make sure that the regulatory process um, you know, captures that uncertainty going forward? However, when you gave everybody flexibility, they seemed really confused. <laughs> and how have you seen the interaction, um, and you know, keep the, the court out of it, but what, what, how have you seen the states embracing that flexibility? Well, the, the first meeting I had after the, the proposed clean power pl uh, plan went out was I was at a Western Governors Association meeting and we were in a small meeting with just the governors and their, their chiefs of staff and, and it was me and a couple of other people and I said, okay, you've been talking about cooperative federalism for a really long time, you just found it. I just put it on your plate. What are you gonna do with it? <laughs> you know, and, and really it was about them taking up the, an opportunity. Um, and they were, uh, people have been a little bit confused. They, they started asking questions of EPA to try to narrow the choices. They asked us to do a model rule to help with that. But, but over time we saw the dynamics quite, that, that it opened up a lot dialogue that we've not really been able to engage before. It was a very good idea to leave it that flexible because states started working together you know, the Western governors had a great opportunity and they continue to have those discussions. You have the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic that have been working together, but beyond that, you got the, the middle of the US started that dialogue and they've been learning from each other and we've been learning from the states. And, and I think the, the greatest thing we did about the Clean Power Plan was never to stop talking, never to stop engaging because we learned a lot between proposal and final that not only made it more legally solid, but made it a, a much, much better uh, proposal and process moving forward. So, uh, so while they were initially confused, I think that freedom grew on them. 
they began to realize that they could chart their own destiny, that it wasn't that hard, and they could sort of hang out with their friends while they did it. How good is that? So thinking about regulation a little bit broadly, you know, one of the critiques of regulation overall is that it can actually stymie innovation. When you have an economy, as you said, that is just so dynamic, so hard to predict, and I know you've thought about that a lot. In addition to just the basic flexibility, how have you thought about trying to make sure that the regulatory process doesn't, in fact, interrupt that natural momentum? That is a really good question because I think we all know that regulations can be drivers, but I think we also are also know that they can be very difficult in terms of having them um, be able to adapt to a changing dynamic like new technologies. I'll give you, you know, two examples. I think in the clean power plan we did a, a good job because we left it very flexible. Uh, but I think when you we are, we have now you know, a second level of judgment that states are asking us to at least guide them on, which is what's in, what's out, especially the clean energy incentive uh, uh, plan that we put in there, the program we put in to try to incent investments in low income and minority communities. Um, but uh, the, the other sort of example I would give you is the challenge we have with the new methane rules, the rules, the rules that we proposed on methane in the oil and gas sector. You know, we're trying to and teed up lots of new technologies for monitoring. Because when EPA now starts shifting to a, a universe we know really well, like the utility industry, right. we know where all of them are, we know how much they emit, and, and we can pretty much track that, the technologies are sound, uh, we know how to do this, and then you move to a sector that we have not effectively regulated, um, you, and, and that's thousands of small things in remote areas, we need, we need new tools. So we teed those up. We got lots of comment on, on those um, ideas. And, and that's where we have, I think, the most difficulty, is how do you write a rule that recognizes where technology is today, but also allows technology improvements to be brought into the system in a way that we can use it. We have monitoring technologies out there now that we've never seen before, bringing in new data, handheld data, you know, handheld monitors that individuals can use walking around where they find localized toxics. And they'll come to EPA and say, look what I found, what are you going to do? And I'll have to go through, well, it hasn't gone through the quap. You know, we don't, you know, we haven't gone through the three or four year process to figure out whether or not we can verify that information. And then, we'll, you know, it's just, it's cumbersome and we need to be more nimble. But we also need people to understand that every technology has limitations. And you can't base every, you know, every data point doesn't generate a, a momentum for a national program. So it's challenging. So you mentioned the um, electric power sector. Yeah. And I think um, EPA has done a tremendous job interacting with that sector at a moment where I think reflective of the technology change, that entire business model is in dramatic flux. The electric power sector generally doesn't have a lot of incentive for the kind of investment that I think um, you know, we see in the crowd today, the real upstream breakthrough activities. What do you think can be done uh, or what should be done to try to help that business model make those kinds of investments? That's a really good question. I mean, there are many ways in which um, EPA tries to incent actions that fall outside of the regulatory arena, and some of those are actually getting very successful. I think one of the biggest things we're trying to do is to simply gather good data and make it public. Because not only EPA cares about making progress on reducing pollution, you know, there's demands being made on companies now to be better actors, to be better better uh, at looking at their environmental footprint and following their supply chain. So some of what I think we need to do is to make sure that we're gathering data and making it public so others can incent that change, like the business community, like the distribution companies who really want to buy natural gas that's as clean and well managed as they can get. You know, and, and that can be a, a big push as well. That, that collaboration has, yeah. I think, from my experience, changed the posture of the industry dramatically. When the Edison Electric Institute, which has always been the you know, largest representative of the big utilities, had a reception after the Paris Climate Summit, um, that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. And so it seems to me that the I the wasn't sure it would have happened last year. It's amazing. So yeah. they're, I think they're pretty proactive actors now in trying yeah. to figure out how to navigate the clean power plan. 
Well, you know, the, particularly in natural gas, the, it's really interesting only because the, what they're leaking is their product. Um, it is our product if it's on federal land, and it's their product otherwise. There are real opportunities here. And as many of you know, we've recently put out a greenhouse gas inventory that really showed that the amount of methane that's being leaked upstream is much larger than we had anticipated. So there's going to be a lot of work done on this. I know everybody knows that we only have like 11 months left in the administration, but you will see us not particularly slowing down in any way, but we're going to keep looking for opportunities moving forward. So talk a little bit about um, technology, this being RPE, and maybe a little bit also about just the fundamental changes in the whole energy sector. You alluded to the increase in natural gas production. But thinking a little bit more about renewables, um, you indicated that we might see 100 gigawatts of new renewable capacity, um, which is um, asymmetrical to any imagination we certainly would have had 10 years ago. A lot of the concern that I understand is the question of how you integrate that much power into the grid, how you deal with the intermittency issues. And you know, I know DOE is also thinking about that a lot, but um, how active is EPA going to be in trying to help people address those questions? Well, it's certainly not where our forte or expertise would lie, but what we have to try to do is talk to those whose expertise it is to understand how much you would rely on that coming into the system. And, you know, I have been going out and meeting with uh, solar generation companies, um, whether it's, you know, distributed generation or whether it's they, they're just doing some large facility, you know, utility level scale. And then now, you know, PJM is now allowing them to bid into the market for the storage that they have. I mean, it, is, it looks to me, when I go into an RTO or an ISO and I see their big board on how they're managing their system and I go into a large utility solar company, the board looks exactly the same. <laughs> they manage the same. They are now bidding into the system. I think that a lot of the drama around this was... Um, a bit self-inflicted. Um, I think that, that it seems to me that they are integrating it as the technology becomes available to do it. I think everybody's interested in storage capacity continuing to move forward as a, a technology. But I am not seeing, uh, at least from my vantage point, that companies are worried about this as, as much as they're excited about it. This is exciting. You know, you're seeing renewables bid in and compete that, that never before. And the progress on wind just in 2015 was remarkable. Very windy you know, year. Remi remarkable. Well, it's, climate's changing, in case you haven't heard. Um, so, so, you know, th there's, there's a lot of excitement, and I think that just generates new opportunities. And I think we ought to stop thinking about it as limitations and start recognizing that this is the opportunities for the U.S., so when we think about how to have a reliable low carbon or non-carbon power sector, we have to think about the zero carbon baseload options. Right. And I know you thought a lot about yeah. nuclear power in this rule. And yeah. when we think globally, we see nuclear expanding aggressively in places like China. Yeah. We see it actually declining aggressively in places like Germany. And the sense here is we're in kind of a holding pattern with the exception of, I think, the courageous move by Southern Company to build a brand new facility. Yeah. But how do you think about nuclear's role? How does the rule contemplate nuclear's role? Well, there's, there's two things about nuclear that we had to consider in here is, is uh, you know, f first of all, how do we look at the new nuclear uh, that is being constructed? And there, there are a few. And we've made room for that and I think built in a way to encourage that to continue. <clears throat> and then there's what do we do with the existing? I think one of the challenges that we face is that Nuclear in some, in some ways and in, in many of the regions is finding it very difficult to compete. And they're, they're up against uh, you know, big decisions, big money decisions on whether to go for additional permitting time because they're old. You know, they need to be uh, updated. Um, and that's something that we found very difficult to do anything other than recognize uh, in the system, the, in the clean power plan. Uh, but, you know, we tried to be very technology neutral in this. You know, we wanted to recognize zero technologies. And if, you know, if we start losing our nuclear facilities that currently exist that are part of the baseload, then there is a tremendous amount of reductions that need to be made up elsewhere else. in the system. And we tried to point that out. 
Uh, so I think there's opportunities for existing to continue and for new facilities. The biggest challenge with nuclear, I think we all know, is, is money. You know, it's, it's cost. So a, a price on carbon that a state could proceed with or in some you know, future universe you could see the Congress moving forward with you think would be important to nuclear's accelerated survival? I think that we all know that the clean power plan is, is something that will survive and is following the trend. But if you really want to get serious, there's a lot more that we need to do on climate. The administration's looking at that with other efforts we can take under existing law. But I have no doubt that over time you're going to be looking at, at congressional action. Um, hopefully a positive congressional action that looks at things like carbon pricing. And it would not surprise me at all that the conversations among states that are already taking place, um, if they don't blossom into some real strategies that they may want to test. And as Jason, I think as you know, lots of the creative strategies start there. Um, and they make their way to the federal level grudgingly and slowly at times. Um, I'm hoping that's not the case, but carbon pricing is, is obviously one of those strategies that the states are talking about. So I want to spend a you know, few minutes really focusing on the other dramatic change in the energy sector, which is the remarkable increase in domestic energy production. You know, only five or six years ago, our imagination was we were essentially an energy weakling, yeah. and you know, we were trying to figure out how we could import LNG. And within essentially five years, we're now switching those uh, gasification plants around to figure out how we can export LNG. Broadly put, how do you see this dramatic increase in hydrocarbons, driven by real technology breakthroughs, how do you see that affecting the trajectory for climate action? Well, I think certainly in the U.S. it's given us room to reduce pollution in ways that have been quite remarkable. And I think people will look at you know, this administration. And frankly, I think one of the best things that this president did was right out of the gate was the ARA money, the recovery money, and investing so heavily in clean energy. That built the foundation for all of these things to actually make their way into the system in a way that was going to change the energy market forever. And so I think. You know, when you look at this, what you're seeing is the advent of, of hydrofracking and, and inexpensive natural gas really driving the market in a way that EPA could then look at and find ways of reducing pollution that were enormously cost effective, that were not cutting edge changing the market but following it. And it's been a remarkable uh, few years in looking at how the amount of of air pollution we have is, is continuing to ratchet down as you know, the inexpensive natural gas changes the market where coal is no longer viable in many areas and no longer competitive. And, and that's a shift that I think from an air pollution standpoint um, has allowed us a lot of uh, flexibility to make progress moving forward. Um, I think from an economic standpoint, you can see where jobs are growing. You can see when you get together with young people where they want to be and what, where they're looking for in terms of their careers. So it has dramatically changed, I think, the economic base of the country and the, and the, and the energy base, but also certainly provided great opportunities for us to make tremendous public health progress. Let's spend a little more time on the kind of relationship between you know, abundance and climate action, because right now I continue to see a really um, divisive debate where you have you know, one camp that is you know, traditionally more associated with a conservative viewpoint really focused on abundance, wondering why the administration is not embracing that as publicly as they would like. You know, another camp focused very much on clean power and you know, seemingly disregarding, and in some cases opposing, the movement towards you know, expanded gas production. Um, the big budget deal that you mentioned that extended the production tax credit essentially created an accidental coalition. There was an effort to get rid of the oil export ban, which we don't have to go into detail on, but certainly we thought was you know, anachronistic and kind of silly public policy that didn't have any real impact on climate. And the only way that got done was to combine it right. with the production tax credit. Could the administration be doing more to point those two communities towards each other? I think the administration is, is trying very hard to find opportunities to leverage those discussions. You know, I think uh, 
and, and I think that those discussions are absolutely going to continue. They're, they're certainly not unrelated. And so I, I can't you know, predict how those are going to go. I think Secretary Moniz is, is more involved in, in these higher level energy discussions certainly than I am. Uh, but the one thing I know for sure is that you know, the president, when we started talking about climate change, you know, he certainly looks at this as a, a, as a global issue. He sees the U.S. as a global player, not looking at domestic policies as if, this is, it, it, as if our consideration should stop at the border. I mean, that's what he's looking at in trade and everything. And so when he brought together uh, the, the administration to look at a climate strategy three or four years ago, um, we, actually longer than that, you know, we designed a strategy where, where Ernie has a really prominent place at the table, as do I, as does uh, Jack Lou to look at the economics. You know, I mean, everybody sits at the table so that you don't miss those leveraging opportunities. It's not, I'm going to negotiate this one thing that's good for me here and not consider what, what else could be partnered with that. It's been a, a wonderful opportunity to work with people who have expertise so that we're talking to the public we serve with a much more sophisticated approach to looking at these issues and moving forward. One that, that answers not only their sort of interest in breathing clean air and in having their kids' future healthy, but also recognizes that, that you can shift an economy in a way that will grow jobs domestically, but also allow us to be more competitive internationally. So I, I don't think I could be in any more interesting or productive conversation than where I am now. The collaboration between DOE and EPA, maybe Can you imagine not that? understood to this audience, is probably as big a um, bridge as the bipartisan challenge. And I think you and Ernie, maybe it's the Boston heritage, but um, it's been a remarkable change in between those two agencies. Uh, we consider it to be good public service. Yeah. So I want to focus just a little more, and since we've known each other since the 90s, um, I'm going to bring up the Keystone Pipeline. Um, you mentioned that the president thinks about these boundaries a lot. I think the president, um, in most of what he has done, has really promoted domestic energy production. The State of the Union a couple of years ago, he created a goal for increased domestic natural gas production. Um, while there have been a lot of debates, um, if you look at many of the actions, uh, where the administration could have done something that the environmental community was calling for to restrict production. He hasn't made those choices. But this one 36-inch wide piece of pipe, I think, became the symbolic expression of whether the administration supported or opposed domestic energy. And the extent to which it dragged out and then ultimately the decision to reject it seemed to me to really empower what's being called kind of the blockadia movement, right? The, you know, some of the environmental community believing that the way to accelerate the future is to essentially undermine the present. Tough one, but you know, EPA was not big advocates for the pipeline. And you know, give, me a, give me and your 14 <laughs> friends here a, a little sense of how you thought well, that one through. I think um, Keystone, how that happened, I don't know. Why Keystone became sort of this, this symbol um, but it was, I think, an effective rallying cry for the environmental community who wanted to get engaged and, and wanted to, to be more prominent on the issues of, of greenhouse gases and climate. You know, for EPA, we tried very hard um, to simply factually look at this, and that's all we did. Um, and, and frankly, it, it left me in a good position when you go to hearings. I said, you know, what we said was that, that you know, the the, uh, the development um, in Canada you know, was producing a crude that was 17% more carbon intensive and carbon generating than our domestic crude. That's a pretty factual statement and I think one that we could defend. So you have to look at that and you have to look at oil prices and you have to look at whether or not this pipeline is actually going to result in more of that crude coming in and being sold and what it meant for greenhouse. That's all we did. And I think I left it up to, to um, Secretary Kerry and the President to decide from a policy perspective how they were going to make the call. And I think they made the right call at the right time. Um, and, and I think you will see them continuing to be as thoughtful as they can be about this. But I think the good news is that we've got um, Prime Minister Trudeau coming really soon. 
Um, it has certainly not damaged our relationship with Canada one little bit. Um, I just spent uh, a, a most interesting hour, I think it was l last week, last week um, with uh, the new environmental minister um, in Canada. She is a whirlwind, and you will see us, you know, basically as, as uh, Canada, U.S., and Mexico, we are, we are going to be aligning our energy strategies. We're going to be having great opportunities to work together in my world on pollution reduction strategies. So nothing but good came of this, in my opinion, and it was the right decision at the right time. So we're talking about oil, and we shift maybe a little bit to the transportation sector. Um, the administration's obviously made very strong um, priority to increase energy efficiency in the transportation sector. I will note that there's a really cool car that was basically made with a printer next door, which um, goes 90 miles an hour. I encourage you to try it. Um, <laughs> the printer goes 90 miles an hour? I think there's a printer in the car that uh, <laughs> continues to make parts as you drive. Um, break that down would off be the cool. Road. New technology, folks. But thinking a little bit about um, the transportation sector and energy efficiency in general, um, I know you think that's very important. I'd love you to talk a little bit about that and then also the challenges with um, you know, $28 to $35 oil in continuing to drive that progress. Yeah, that, it, 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 is, it is challenging. Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd ask other people to join in this because I've been asked this question a bunch of times because if everybody looks at the light duty vehicle rules that we did, which was our effort to establish greenhouse gas emission limits, we agreed that we'd do this midterm review uh, that we're beginning to take a look at how the, the shift in the auto industry is happening and whether it still is viable to continue to drive this to double the fuel economy by 2025. And I had this conversation the other day. Um, I, I found it remarkable that all the major automakers are delivering electric cars uh, because we're not requiring that. You know, it is, it is uh, uh, and, I, and I, I think that there's a real shift in the way people are thinking about automobiles. Um, I, I'm, fi I'm finding it remarkable because it's a shift I didn't really anticipate. I think we're going to do better than we anticipated because I think people are beginning to change their view of electric vehicles. I think the demand on infrastructure is, for electric vehicles is getting higher. Um, and I think that uh, Tesla and others, Elon Musk, I think is, is here at this conference at some point. I mean, they're, they're, they're looking to be really cool now. So in terms uh, of so really it's kind cool, of interesting. The, you know, the rage in the valley now mm -hmm. are these autonomous driving I know. vehicles. Now, having survived Boston traffic for uh, <laughs> more than a couple of decades, we could both understand the advantages of that, but has EPA <laughs> started to take that seriously in terms of the air pollution impacts, benefits that that could provide? I think that we've been really focused, you know, the, the auto industry is, is really, the, for, for traditional pollutants, it's really clean. So the question is really, the v, how do you get VMT down? And that is where the challenge is for, for inexpensive oil. And, and so we, we have two ways of doing that. And, and they're, they're both being worked on by the administration. And we're just trying to make sure that we get the fleets as clean as we can, uh, but also look at infrastructure building, which DOE is looking at in terms of making sure new technologies have a, a position. But we also, you know, are looking at what are the transportation strategies that you bring to the table. And that's where Anthony Fox has been working, Secretary Fox. But I was with Secretary Fox the other day. He's really bullish yeah, he's on a, this technology. He's, he's a cool guy. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a, a both excited and frightened by it. Um, it's just kind of new for me. I'm, I'm trying to get my head around it. But you're right. If it, uh, we, machines are mu would be much better drivers than Boston drivers would ever be, that's, without question. I don't care what machine, a microwave would work as far as I'm concerned, better than what we do. You've, um, you know, we focus a lot on the clean power plant. It's obviously been kind of the centerpiece of the discussion. You've spoken a little bit, well, more than a little bit, about the methane focus. But, you know, other strategies that the administration yeah. is undertaking that kind of rounds out that portfolio, you know, what are the yeah. couple that you'd really point to? Um, I actually, it, it, this is something which I think you've worked on before. I'm finding all of the aircraft discussion to be interesting. Uh, I, in case you don't know, we, we actually regulate internationally aircraft through a, an organization called ICAO. And they have recently voted to uh, get some uh, greenhouse gas 
um, requirements for new uh, air aircraft uh, moving forward, which is really about the engines and the aircraft itself. EPA has to look at it as well because we have to be the one to regulate moving forward so that we can uh, participate in that. It's an old discussion, but one where the dyna dynamics are changing as well. And we're going to be looking at market-based measures um, across, uh, uh, the, across countries internationally to see how we can keep driving those numbers down because it's really high. Those numbers are, are escalating as people fly more. But the one that I'm, more, uh, that I'm more engaged in personally is the hydrofluorocarbons, the HFC issue, which is we, we, you know, we've taken care of and are repairing the hole in the ozone layer while we're creating you know, other problems um, with, with uh, replacements of CFCs that actually are highly global warming. And so we're trying, um, I'm really attending those meetings myself now uh, with the Department of State so that we can get uh, changes in some areas. Uh, and it's work that DOE is working very heavily on uh, to figure out how we get HFCs out of the system. And a lot of it is, is dealing with countries that have high ambient temperature and how do we make sure that the technologies and the chemicals that we use are both lower in terms of their greenhouse gas intensity, but also effective in maintaining the efficiency that we've been able to achieve in our refrigeration and manufacturing of foam and other, uh, and other products. So that's, I think that's really interesting. It's a very productive international discussion in a forum that's been, this is, this is to do an amendment to the Montreal Protocol which is really has been the most effective international treaty I think we've ever had, certainly environmentally. And it will be effective, I think, in being a venue f to reduce HFCs, because if we don't, they're so highly global warming, they will dwarf some of the other reductions that we're able to achieve. But we're not going to stop there. We're looking at landfills. We're looking at lots of different things uh, moving forward, and we'll keep looking. Knowing you as I do, I imagine if you stick around, it'll be 11.59 and January 19th <laughs> that you will drop your last regulatory proposal <laughs> you bet. across the line. You so bet. Um, this being the crucible of innovation, I want to spend the last couple of minutes um, talking about uh, what happened uh, with mission innovation, the efforts to try to increase both public and private investment in upstream R&D. And I think a couple of things struck me as very important, which I hope you might reflect on. The first is that instead of the conversation with developing countries being, how can we throw money at you? The conversation started to shift to how can we, the countries with the resources, invent the technologies that enable you to develop without undermining carbon goals. And then the second um, change is I really think the combination of the government really focusing on this kind of upstream R&D and then folks like Bill Gates yes. coming in saying there's private capital that can kind of catch that R&D and then turn it into commercial um, you know, products. That works very well, I think, in the kind of congressional discussion where there's always been some conservative mistrust of government taking that next step towards implementation. And so you know, do you feel that the mission innovation efforts as important as I do? And how do you think it might affect the good people in the room? Well, I, no, I have to give Secretary Moniz his due because he did a remarkable job on mission innovation. Um, I talked to, when I was in Paris, a lot of the countries that are participating in it. And for the first time, I feel like they, instead of being sort of a, a bystander, they have become integral to really pushing this issue forward. They see that as being beneficial to them. And that's a change in a couple of different ways. And, and you mentioned it, I, I think that that they are uh, seeing this uh, change towards, uh, towards a low carbon future as being inevitable. I think they see it as inevitable. There were really no climate deniers in Paris. Um, it, was, it, was, it was how do we get there? Uh, but I also think they, their ability to produce funds and look at their own future and invest in that as something that would keep them competitive. They see a market here that they've never seen before. Um, and that's a shift that's been quite remarkable over the last decade. And, and I think it's all because of the new technologies that are coming up, the, the understanding that this is a global challenge, the understanding that the market is global in nature, and people don't want to be left behind. Um, and so the, I think the idea of, of climate change is now turning, from, it, turning into an opportunity discussion. 
as, as much as it's, what are you going to give me to do what I should be doing anyways? And, and you know, the only other thing, Jason, and in some ways it's a reflection of, of businesses standing up and recognizing in very stock terms the threat that climate change poses to them. Um, I, one of the most amazing meetings I had in Paris was with uh, the CEO of Kellogg. And he, he was there talking to anybody he could talk about, and this is why Bill Gates and others are engaged, is it scares the heck out of these businesses. You know, they see the damage, they see the disruption, and they need to make sure it doesn't get worse. Um, they want action. So having the, the large, you know, multinational businesses stand up and say, we have to stop fooling around about this. We have to start investing, changes everything. Um, and it's changed everything. So in closing, um, I want to thank you for one thing. Just one. Just one. Because it is your essence. And it is the authenticity and directness that you have brought to this conversation. Because while there are many people with a lot of really strongly differently held views, um, you have been a different kind of administrator because you have always just gone right at it with exactly what you believe. And there's been no question about where you're coming from. And I think that's really been um, incredibly important to enabling the kind of conversation that we've had. So it's a pleasure to know you. And I really think everyone here should um, express their gratitude for the leadership you've shown. Thank you, Jason. You too.